For the past two years, I've been investigating the emergence and spread of nightmare bacteria, superbugs that are increasingly resistant to even the strongest antibiotics. The bacteria are fighting back and they're defeating the drug. I've been tracking the phenomenon through hospitals around the country where doctors have been dealing with patients infected by these superbugs. I found outbreaks that have paralyzed some of our best hospitals. And no matter what we did, the bacteria was still, it was still spreading. More than 20,000 people a year are dying from these infections, and as many as 2 million get sick from them. What's become apparent is that these nightmare infections are being fueled by the overuse of antibiotics, creating bugs we can't kill. But the more I looked into it, the more I saw there was another dimension to the story. It turns out most antibiotics aren't even used by humans. They're used on farms. Among the many valuable new products created in agricultural laboratories are mass-produced antibiotics. The FDA says 80% of all antibiotics sold in the United States are fed to livestock. Once something special for Sunday dinner, chicken, inspected and graded, is now thrifty every day. People don't realize how expensive chicken used to be. So antibiotics helped us get to inexpensive chicken. And higher quality. They had discovered that if you add these drugs to the feed of animals, they were very useful in increasing the productivity of the animal. They kept them healthy. It gains the same amount of weight on less feed. Feed is a very big cost. Livestock had been dosed up just to make the animals put on weight faster. Tyson is the biggest meatpacking company in the history of the world. The industry changed the entire way the chicken are raised. Birds are now raised and slaughtered in half the time they were 50 years ago, but now they're twice as big. People like to eat white meat, so they redesigned the chicken to have large breasts. Today, chicken farmers no longer control their birds. A company like Tyson owns the birds from the day they're dropped off until the day that they're slaughtered. When they grow from a chick, and in seven weeks you've got a five and a half pound chicken, their bones and their internal organs can't keep up with the rapid growth. A lot of these chickens here, they can take a few steps and then they plop down. It's because they can't keep up with all the weight that they're carrying. We're creating resistant organisms that may ultimately transfer that resistance to organisms that cause human disease. Superbugs, resistant to antibiotics and growing in America's favorite food, chicken, are being transmitted to humans. You don't have a normally healthy 30-year-old woman come in who's never been in a hospital with a resistant urinary tract infection that's moved to her blood. It feels like I have some type of infection that just won't go away. I couldn't function fully for weeks, almost a month. They ran the tests again and confirmed that yes, I still had the infection. It began, as I said, with doctors coming to us, expressing concern that they are beginning to see something quite dangerous in their hospitals. They are seeing that more and more patients that they are trying to treat with antibiotics, the antibiotics are not working, that people are resistant. Think of the procedures that could not happen, chemotherapy, Caesarean sections, hip replacements, all of them absolutely rely on antibiotics. So imagine a world when we can't have those procedures and when people die of simple blisters, as occurred not uncommonly in the pre-antibiotic era. Over the last three years, we've reported on deadly infections at the nation's most prestigious hospitals, the rise of antibiotic resistance. Resistant, 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 resistant. Both in humans and in animals. And now, a common bacteria that has become dangerous in new ways, Salmonella. Salmonella sickens and kills more of us than any other foodborne pathogen. It is a very scary situation where you have a perfectly healthy 17-year-old female, and 48 hours later, she's dying. They said, this is Salmonella Heidelberg. If you look at the two bacteria that are most likely to send you to the hospital from food, it's Salmonella and a germ called Campylobacter. And if you look at the foods that are most likely to be the source for those bacteria, it's chicken. About one in four pieces of raw chicken carry Salmonella and sickens more than a million Americans every year. 
about 200,000 from contaminated poultry. Four companies now control more than half the market in chicken processing, and it means those companies have a lot of control over our food. At the top, the very top of the chain, there are really just two breeders controlling the entire poultry supply in the sense that they provide the eggs, and those companies largely operate in secrecy. Their customers are not the public, they're not very communicative, and it's very hard to tell what practices they're using to keep those eggs from spreading disease. Over the past 15 years, salmonella outbreaks linked to poultry have become an increasing public health concern. Between 1998 and 2012, chicken and turkey have been associated with 278 salmonella outbreaks. You can go to Europe and buy packages that are labeled, you know, pathogen free there. You can't get that in the United States. They don't think of it as food. It becomes a commodity. Profit is more important than ethics. The industry doesn't want you to know the truth about what you're eating, because if you knew, you might not want to eat it. So, your Tyson Foods in the 1930s, compared to the behemoth it is today, Tyson. Back then, you were just a cute little chicken delivery company that shuttles chickens from farm to market. And you were not making much money from this. That's because back then, people weren't obsessed with eating chicken like they are today. No one could afford it. It wasn't widely available. And it was actually considered kind of a delicacy. So for you, Tyson Foods, shuttling chickens around was not that lucrative. But then, the chicken boom happened. It was the dawn of World War II, and the American government decided to ration beef and pork, the good meats, so there would be enough meat to feed the soldiers. But you know what they didn't ration? Chicken. And of course, the public were happy to oblige. Anything for the war effort. And so, beef and pork was out, and chicken was in. Chicken became the only protein source readily available. And as one of the only chicken companies around, this was the opportunity of a lifetime for you. Forget just shuttling chickens to market. Now was your time to take the chicken and put it on every single American's plate. And you don't really care who you have to step over to make your dream a reality. But there was a problem. The chickens of back then looked nothing like the big, fat, bland chickens we have today. Back then, chickens were scrawny. They barely had any meat on them. In fact, the chicken of around 100 years ago was around four and a half times smaller than the chickens of today, which made them less profitable. So if you wanted to take advantage of this opportunity of a lifetime to dominate the meat market, you would have to get creative. You'd have to pump chickens so full of drugs, so full of antibiotics, you'd have to soak them in so many toxic chemicals, you'd have to scale up your slaughterhouses to kill up to 200 chickens a minute, all in an effort to turn chickens into the fat, flavorless, yet profitable monstrosity that it is today. If you could grow a chicken in 49 days, why would you want one you gotta grow in three months? More money in your pocket. And what happens when the entire population is feeding on a bird that has been modified to be four and a half times bigger than it actually is? Well, spoiler alert, it can't be good. And this all started with something called the Chicken of Tomorrow Contest. Welcome to Evil Food Supply. And these are the origins of America's disturbing love affair with chicken. We have by far the safest food supply in the entire world. The safest food supply in the world. Let's remember one thing. We have the safest food supply in the world right here in the U.S. And we have the best, most efficient, safest food supply in the entire world. And by golly, we need to keep it that way. Today, U.S. chicken is disgusting and can sometimes lead to salmonella poisoning. And if you have ever been hurt by big food, then you have to sue them. It's the only way to keep them in check. The only problem is that suing costs a lot of money. But luckily, that is where this law firm called Morgan & Morgan comes in. Morgan & Morgan is a law firm where you only pay if you win your case. And they actually just won a giant case against 3M recently. But they don't just take on giant cases like this. Let's say you got into a wrongful car accident or were the victim of medical malpractice or even the Maui wildfires, for example, or any of the other areas they practice in. All you have to do is go to forthepeople.com EFS with the link below. There, you'll be able to submit your claim in as little as eight clicks or less. 
And from there, Morgan & Morgan will evaluate your case, and that's it. If they take your case, you're going to have America's largest injury law firm fighting for you for zero dollars out of pocket. Like how they won a $1.8 billion settlement for a giant gas leak that happened in Los Angeles back in 2021. So you can scroll down and click the link below to go to ForThePeople.com EFS to get your free case evaluation today. Thanks to Morgan & Morgan for sponsoring the video. Because of the red meat rationing during World War II, people became crazy for chicken. And for people like Howard Doc Pierce, the poultry director of A&P grocery stores, this was like a gold rush. His chicken sales were going through the roof. It was awesome. But Doc knew that World War II wasn't going to last forever. And pretty soon, this chicken craze would end and everyone would go back to buying the same old boring red meat they were used to. Unless he did something strategic to make this public craze for chicken permanent. Enter the Chicken of Tomorrow contest, a nationwide contest funded by A&P grocery stores that challenged farmers to breed the fattest chicken they could. Doc wanted chickens that had giant breasts, giant thighs, and humongous, juicy drumstick legs. Because the more meat these chickens packed on, the more money for both the stores and the farmers. He put out the call for farmers to breed the one bird chunky enough for the whole family, and the submissions came pouring in. Then he gathered the 40 fattest birds and raised them in a controlled environment for 12 weeks. After the 12 weeks, the chickens would be slaughtered and judged based on the size, weight, and juiciness. While he was busy breeding the perfect bird, he was also spending his time getting the public more excited about eating chicken. There were Chicken of Tomorrow themed dances, guided tours, a rodeo, a parade. He even crowned a Chicken of Tomorrow queen. This contest would double as one of the most important PR campaigns for Big Chicken. And when the 12 weeks finally came to an end, he had his winners. Arbor Acres White Feather Chicken and a Red Cornish Cross from Van Tress Hatchery. These two chickens would eventually be crossbred to create the genetic line for the chicken that would come to dominate every single chicken farm worldwide today. The Arbor Acre breed. The stage was set. Chicken companies, including your company, Tyson, started to raise these huge chickens en masse. And this was something that's never been done before. But there was still one problem left. The price of chicken was always volatile. It was constantly going up and down. That's because to raise chickens, you need to feed them chicken feed. And chicken feed is made up out of corn and soy, commodities that were also constantly going up and down in price. So one month, you're making bank on your chickens, and the next, you're fresh out of luck. The horror! So what do you do? Well, you and the other chicken companies gotta find a few clever ways to stretch your dollar and your chickens as far as they can go. And it all starts with optimizing the factory farms. It all starts with the grow houses you raise the chickens in. The goal here is to grow as many of them as fast as possible so they can get into our bellies as fast as possible. So you want to cram as many of them in here as possible. You see, most grow houses pack in more than 10 times as many birds. Which looks a little something like this. And don't worry if you accidentally step on one of them. And your workers? You gotta get them to the bone. One man who worked for Tyson said that his hands hurt so much that he couldn't even make dinner or hold his child after his shift. A reporter said that the line workers from the Tyson chicken plant had irreversible wrist problems and many had to get surgery just to continue to work. And because chicken factories are always short-staffed, machinery is constantly breaking down. It's dreadful. I mean, and in conjunction with the other pictures of the big heaps of guts, etc., it would seem the equipment in this plant malfunctions pretty often. Well, my God, it's just unbelievable. It's terrible. So you've got your grow houses, you got your chicks, you've got your workers. Now, how are we going to grow these chickens as big and fat as possible? Excuse me, ma'am. 
Are you going to be purchasing any chicken in that fine retail establishment? A Foster Farms. Well, you know, <laughs> we're Foster Farms chickens. No, you're not. Sure we are. No way. Foster Farms chickens are fresh and natural. No hormones, no preservatives. Besides, they're corn fed. Back in the 1950s, chicken factory owners such as yourself learned that when you feed antibiotics to chickens, they not only prevent illness, but also make your chickens super fat. It was like a miracle drug. I get to keep more of my chickens from dying and have more meat to sell? Antibiotics it is then. So you started dumping antibiotics into your chicken feed, not realizing that by doing so, you were creating super bugs. This meant that whoever ate your chicken would be exposed to a new mutant strain of bacteria that was resistant to antibiotics. In America, you have an industry that's knowingly using subtherapeutic uses of antibiotics, creating drug-resistant bacteria, and then distributing those bacteria to every grocery store in the country. The recent Foster Farms outbreak with drug-resistant salmonella, multi-drug-resistant salmonella, what happens? They blame us. They say, people need to cook their meat better. Would we allow a company to pump toxic fumes into the air and then tell us to wear gas masks? But antibiotics weren't the only drugs you were using on your chickens. There was another exciting, fattening drug on the market you wanted to use. Pfizer's Roxersome. This drug kills parasites, fattens chickens, and also happens to be incredibly toxic. Roxersone created an inorganic, cancer-causing form of arsenic in the bodies of your chickens. So guess where that arsenic was ending up? When other countries like the UK and Japan heard about how bad Roxersone was, they banned it right away. But of course, not the US. Some chicken farms voluntarily removed the drug from their chicken feed, but up until 2011, when it was officially taken off the market by Pfizer, most farmers in the US were still using it. So now that you have the fattest chickens possible, now it's time for the fun part, slaughtering them. Federal law states that before a farm animal is slaughtered, they need to be unconscious so they don't feel pain. But chicken factories don't have to follow this rule. So you stun your chickens so they can't move. But when you slit their throats, they still feel the pain. If you don't legally have to be nice to your chickens, why bother? And once they are slaughtered, well, you gotta process them. On the outside, your chicken processing plant looks clean, pristine, and perfectly automated. But let's be real, you're not processing vegetables and grains here, you're processing live animals. And when you're quickly processing chickens on a factory line, those chickens are gonna excrete a whole bunch of gross substances, things like feces, blood, and guts. So you gotta wash this stuff off somehow. But worry not, because all you gotta do is dunk your chickens in a fecal soup. AKA, a water bath that's full of chicken feces that a microbiologist from the USDA compares to literal toilet water. Your chickens will soak in this disgusting communal bath for up to one hour before getting packaged. And a quarter million chickens will pass through this soup before the water's finally changed. Hey, we gotta stretch that dollar. Once the chickens are done soaking in this slop, they're still gonna have some bacteria and feces on them. So what do you do next? You dunk them in a bath of chlorine bleach. And we're not talking about the chlorine you find in a swimming pool now. Public swimming pools contain chlorine at two parts per million. The chlorine solution you're dumping your chickens in is at 50 parts per million. And guess what? The consumption of chlorine bleach has been proven to cause cancer, heart disease, and impaired brain function in high doses. But you don't care, because if you don't kill that bacteria, your chicken might get infected with salmonella or campylobacter and make your customers really sick really fast. So what's worse? Customers getting sick decades down the line that will be impossible to trace back to you, or customers getting instantly sick right after eating your chicken and then suing you on the spot. So yeah, the chlorine bleach it is. And if you didn't know, that is why American chicken is banned in the European Union. They don't want people scarfing down chlorine-soaked chicken nuggets. But lucky for you, it's totally legal in the US. That's because for big chicken, chlorine bleach is your lifeline. It's the reason why you can kill chickens at such lightning speeds. But sometimes, contaminants still slip through the cracks. The USDA says they have a zero-tolerance policy for fecal contamination in chicken. But what they really mean is a zero-tolerance to visible fecal contamination. So according to them, if you can't see it, you can sell it. And this lackadaisical policy has ruined the lives of countless of Americans. 
In 2000, Cargill sold contaminated poultry that killed four people and caused three miscarriages. Foster Farms had to close their plant when their salmonella-infected chicken sickened over 600 people, including children. They had to take him in for this MRI. This new surgeon takes a look at the MRI and he said, this is an abscess and it's growing. You will have to do a craniotomy where they cut his scalp from one ear almost all the way over to the other and they take a piece of his skull out. It was surreal, just completely out of control. The surgery lasted nearly four hours. When Noah first came back to the room, you know, it was scary. I mean, he was, he was in a coma. Days later, doctors finally explained the mystery behind his brain infection. They said, this is Salmonella Heidelberg. And he said that, you know, it doesn't usually happen that they get brain abscesses from Salmonella Heidelberg. But FSIS had recently done research showing that about one in four chicken parts nationally were actually contaminated with Salmonella. So they quickly began testing the chicken parts from Foster Farms. When we sampled the Foster Farms plants, in three of them, we found roughly 25% of chicken parts, maybe slightly higher, had salmonella. So in the middle of the outbreak, it's right. building steam. Yes. And you do more sampling of yes. chicken parts. That's right. With under Foster Farms. Right. And you find that one in four pieces of chicken are contaminated. With salmonella, predominantly salmonella Heidelberg. When Foster Farms was caught selling diseased meat, they closed their plant, but not because of salmonella. With the USDA shutting down the 250,000 square foot facility in Livingston. It's closed this morning because of a cockroach infestation. A lot of customers are understandably worried, and so they have closed it down. Why cockroaches and not salmonella? Why close a plant over cockroaches? Cockroaches, infestations of any pest, can bring in pathogens, salmonella, or other things that could contaminate the environment, could contaminate products. It just sure just shows how ineffectual they are because, you know, salmonella kills people. Yeah, don't worry, everybody. It's not because of the poop water. It's because of a few cockroaches that broke into the factory. Because if the word salmonella was ever associated with your chicken plant, your reputation would be done. So you just close your doors temporarily and keep running your birds through the same old fecal soup. If we can get our hands on that American humane seal, we can convince everyone we were raised right, like Foster Farms chickens. natural chemical free chicken do i got this foster farms no added hormones or steroids raised right and certified by the american humane association always natural always fresh now that we've lowered the cost of our chickens as far down as it can go and now that our chickens are processed packaged and ready to ship how are we going to maximize how much we can sell this chicken for scientist named Robert C. Baker first invented the chicken nugget in 1963, you couldn't help but get a little excited. See, this little nugget would become a miracle for your bottom line. Why? Look at it this way. You could charge $9.99 for a package of whole chicken breasts, or you could charge the same $9.99 for a dinky little box of deep fried nuggets that contained way less chicken meat. Obviously, you're gonna go with the second option. That way, you're making way more profit on each sale, so you're no longer at the whims of nature. And when McDonald's finally introduced McNuggets in 1981, the masses went wild for them. People were literally lining up around the block for these processed nuggets that don't even have that much chicken in them. I'm into nuggets, y'all. I'm into nuggets, y'all. But why stop there? See, the great thing about chicken is that unlike a burger that has the reputation of being unhealthy, chicken is lean. It has low fat, making it the perfect candidate for being marketed as a healthy fast food alternative. Chicken salad. Chicken sandwich. Chicken. Chicken salad. Chicken chopped salads. Grilled chicken salad. And that's exactly what fast food chains have been doing in recent years. There's a chain in this country, Chick-fil-A, who's doing fantastic 
Yeah. Fantastic. And what are they doing? Selling chicken. As? As a sandwich. As a sandwich. Uh, in, in fact, this chicken sandwich is slowly becoming the new burger. We love sandwich. The number one food eaten in this country is a sandwich. Not chicken on a bone. No, no, no. It's inconvenient. Messy. And what's the beauty of a sandwich? I can drive and eat it. I, it's very portable. Right. We like sandwiches. Yeah. <laughs> Never mind that these chicken meals are deep fried in seed oils and contain a ton of artificial chemicals. That won't matter because people just want the feeling of eating healthy. Fast forward to today, in America and the world, is more hooked than ever on chicken. It's the most farmed animal on Earth, with more than three chickens to every human on the planet. And every year, Americans alone consume 8 billion whole birds. That's 24 whole chickens per person. And most of that chicken, at least in America, is filled with all the chlorine, antibiotics, and other terrible stuff that we went over earlier. But this doesn't mean you should avoid chicken altogether. You just need to find the right source. Short of raising your own chickens on a homestead, your best bet is buying chicken that is labeled both organic and pasture raised. Organic means that the chickens have been fed organic feed their entire lives with no antibiotics, GMOs, or pesticides. And pasture raised means that the chickens are allowed to spend most of their time outside, pecking at the grass in eating and foraging for insects. Chickens are omnivores, so not letting them eat worms and bugs can result in their meat and eggs being deficient in nutrients. So you want both labels when you buy chicken, organic and pasture raised. And the same goes for eggs. I think now more than ever, we have access to high quality pasture raised chickens, chicken eggs and chicken meat for eating. And I wanted to really stress and break down the fact that it's really important to be eating those because it's better for nutrition, it's better for the farmer, and it's better for the chickens, and it's better for the ground, the environment. And more importantly, don't be so bought into chicken because it has low fat. Humans need the natural fats and micronutrients found in red meat. And because cows weren't so drastically altered, unlike chickens, beef tastes way better, and we would bet that it's probably way better for you. But not many people realize this because red meat has been completely demonized in today's society. But seed oils, pesticides, phthalates, processed foods, and much more? Nope, no demonization of those things. And it is all by design. We're going to have a documentary on the demonization of red meat soon, so make sure you subscribe. And a lot of you have said that it would be nice if we had a page where we list all of our recommendations all in one place instead of just our newsletter. So we're happy to introduce the Evil Food Supply Storefront. This is a page that we'll be periodically updating with all the products we personally use and recommend, along with a short explanation as to why. And you can check it out now by clicking the square on the screen or by clicking the link below. We're still learning, so as our recommendations change, we'll be sure to email you. Just make sure you sign up for the newsletter if you're not already on this page as well. Click the square on the screen or click the link below to check out our recommended products now.